Hi, I'm Ronnie Chatterjee, and welcome to the Fuqua School of Business. I've been a professor here since 2006, but it was only last year that I started teaching a new class on business and politics. And one of the main reasons I taught that class was because some of the research I've been doing on CEO activism. CEOs speaking out on social and political issues that are indirectly or even unrelated to their business. I'm joined here today by Jenny Cook and James Adams, two of my students from this year's course. And we're gonna talk about CEO activism throughout the next several minutes and hopefully take a lot of your questions and comments. Jenny has an iPad here ready to take questions from the audience. And we also have some topics that, well, maybe are unresolved from class discussion that I wanted to get Jenny and James' opinion on. Let me just talk a little bit about the research we've done on CEO activism, and then Jenny's gonna start us off with some great questions. CEO activism is something I've been studying since about 2015. I noticed that a bunch of business leaders were speaking out on political and social issues. As we talked about in class, a lot of these issues were pretty divisive. When I was growing up, CEOs talked about taxes, education, maybe immigration, but not about issues around race, sexual orientation, or even directly commenting on the president. What you've seen since 2015, though, is CEOs are feeling more emboldened to speak out on issues. What's also been interesting, though, is to see what kinds of speech they've given and how it's been received by their customers and the policy officials they've been speaking about. Tim Cook is a Fuqua School of Business alum, and he spoke out very prominently on Indiana's state law, for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 2015. In large part because of Tim Cook and other business leaders, Indiana re repealed and modified that law in 2015. Here in our home state of North Carolina, HB2, House Bill 2, draw, drew outcries from PayPal CEO, Dan Shulman, Mark Benioff at Salesforce and other CEOs. President Trump's immigration ban brought several CEOs out to speak. But as we've been teaching this class, there's also been a lot of changes. CEOs are having to confront new issues that don't neatly align the political spectrum between American right and left. Our international audience has become more interested in seeing CEOs speak out on issues in their countries. And even organizations like the National Basketball Association and the National Football League have been thinking about how to tackle divisive social and political issues. So with that, I wanna to turn to Jenny and James to talk a little bit and ask me some questions and each other about why do we think this is happening? Is it a good thing for business? And do we think that consumers, particularly younger consumers, are gonna respond well to CEO activism or do CEOs risk turning off important parts of their customer base? So Jenny, I know we have a couple of questions we've talked about. There might be some more coming in. Where do you wanna start? Yeah, I think a really good place to start would be just on why this is happening. Like, what do people see as the benefit of this? I know we talked a little bit about this in class, but it might be an interesting place to start on why you see people actually moving towards CEO activism. Is it because they really truly care about something or is it a little bit more insidious? Because I think James might agree with It's a great point. And one of the nice things about this class is I'll start with the answer, but James is gonna have his answer too. And one of the reasons I wanted him to join us today was because he spoke about this in class number one. This is a class, and a lot of our classes at Fuqua are different than this, but this is a class where the professor doesn't have a monopoly on truth, and I've told these guys several times, and I'm sure we would disagree on lots of different issues, but the challenge is training our leaders here at Fuqua to be leaders of consequence going forward in their career. So you're gonna see lots of different opinions, and I'll give mine about why it's happening, and we'll hear from James too, I think, and Jenny as well on this point. For me, I think it started off that a lot of CEOs felt very strongly about some of these issues. They also felt that the political system was gridlocked on issues that they cared about, not necessarily the most important issues, although sometimes there were. And they felt some special responsibility, and in some cases hubris, in terms of feeling that they could make a difference. After all, these are men, and primarily men and women, who run the largest corporations in America and around the world. And they feel like they've done something that is amazing and against all odds, which in many cases is true. You think about Howard Schultz building Starbucks. After you do something like that, why not think that you could also change the conversation on race in America? So I think one of the reasons was this conviction that they could really make a difference. I think the second thing, and James can pick up on after this, is I think they thought their consumers agreed with them. I think a lot of people felt, and this was before pre the President Trump was elected, but even afterwards too, where their consumers were really into politics and thinking about that. And as you're bringing your brand into a proposition that says, I'm selling you this coffee, not just because it's the best tasting coffee, but because of who you are, all of a sudden you get tied up into identity and politics. I think a lot of CEOs are appealing to the political sensibilities of some of their consumers, and those are probably two reasons why CEOs are speaking now. But, uh, but James made a really nice point on this in the first class that I wanted him to pick up on and maybe give some additional thoughts on. Yeah, I, I'm definitely more of the cynic in the class, and especially when you start hearing news, like I think it was Dick's CEO, that he was thinking about running for political office, that you start, or at least in my mind, I started to question why was he taking these stands? Mm -hmm. And not only was he taking stands, there are stands that a lot of his customers supported. And I think this is also seen in the NBA with uh, 
with the bill in, in North Carolina where they took a very politically active stance to support, in their mind, uh, freedom for you know, not to discriminate against people. And then you have the Hong Kong issue uh, that takes place where now the NBA is not so vocal about supporting freedom and in, in something that I think is a, a much more acute crisis where, where actually lives are on the line. So that's just where I kind of sit on the, the cynical side of the, the spectrum. And, and I can see, and Jenny, I want to hear from you this too. I mean, the opinion, you may agree or disagree, but that's an opinion we weren't hearing when we first taught the class. The NBA hadn't had this issue in China. So a lot of people were focused on the NBA's um, activism on race-related issues, police shooting of unarmed black men in the United States, vis-a-vis -vis the NFL, and making the positive comparison for most of the students in the class, not all, but most, on the National Basketball Association. But now we're teaching a class where the NBA is grappling with their response to China and Hong Kong. And when James made this point, I saw a lot of heads nodding and saying, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way. And it's not clear that everyone in the class agrees. There were other comments in different directions. But when you see those heads nodding, you know that you're facilitating a good discussion where different opinions can be sort of put out there. I think one of the hardest things, and we all agree, I think we've talked about this in different ways, is how do you get different opinions on these issues that aren't just business, but also political and social at a time when we're really divided? And I thought James did a good job in that first class and beyond in terms of presenting a view that you know a lot of people agree with and a lot of people didn't, but going back and forth on that. Jenny, how about you? And you in this class, we're also making some really interesting comments on it. And in later classes, we'll talk about too, where do you come down on the sort of the argument versus this is only about business? versus there's some higher mission and purpose in business for why they're speaking out. How, do you, how do you, have you thought about it? Yeah, I think I have a little bit of cynicism towards it, but a little less than James maybe. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at the firm and we learn in business school, like the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholder value, right? That's been the thing since Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. And so after you have that, you look and you look at things like Nike, for example, question, yeah. with um, some of the, with Colin Kaepernick and kneeling and things like that. And yes, Nike had a small decline in some of their sales right away. But after that, it was really impressive. Some of their core consumers really identified with that. And and actually, a lot of people have posited that it's been a really positive thing for Nike sales. Mm -hmm. So when I look at some of the CEO activism, it's interesting to see where they'll stay silent and where they'll talk about things. And if that actually will help, because I think there's a lot of things that, yes, consumers want it. But on the other hand, there's also this point around employees. Uh, a lot of the employees moving forward are millennials, uh, like me, mm -hmm. who care about where they work. Uh, prior to coming to business school, I used to work in a lot of oil and gas companies. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting when I would tell my peers what I did, they go, oh my God, you're working for them. Yes. And that was tough. So when you have a company that really aligns with your, not only your consumer's mission, but also your employees, I think that can really benefit the firm. This is a great point. I mean, one thing we talk a lot about how customers respond. Jetty's introducing this whole other idea, which I think might be even a stronger motivation for CEOs to speak out, which is how your employees respond. And I've talked to lots of CEOs who say, it's really my employees who urge me to speak out on this. I also think your example of working in oil and gas is really interesting. You know, the Fuqua School of Business, we're sending students to all kinds of industries. You know, Jenny and James have jobs lined up at Bain and LEK doing consulting, but there's students working in oil and gas. There's students who are going to work for companies like Juul, right? And so the notion of how you talk about your employer and how other people respond to it can matter to you and your identity. I also think the interesting ones are when we had um, a guest speaker from a tech company, a tech company that when he joined was one of the most popular names to be working for uh, in the world. And over time, the reputation has changed such that when he tells people he works there, he gets a different response. And so a question to ask if you're someone who's recruiting right now for a job is, how much of your job is about what other people think about where you work and the identity of the brand versus the work you're actually doing and, and weighing those things. And you know, I'm proud to be at Duke um, as an employer and uh, whether we win or lose in basketball, I'm very proud. Um, but there are different issues where if you work for companies, you may see it differently over time. Um, yeah. Jenny, how about other things that you think are interesting on this that we should talk about on CEO activism or the class? Yeah, actually, I'll defer to one of our comments coming oh, already. in. already, this is great. Yeah, I know. This so there's exciting. people out there. Hello, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. No, but you actually talked about Duke being a pretty inclusive <laughs> employer and things yes. like that. And we have a question from uh, Nishta in Delhi, okay, actually. Cool. And she asked, do CEOs need to be extra cautious before they voice their opinions on political issues? Well, so first of all, thanks for watching in India. We have, and we have many Indian students in our class, which is really cool. Uh, we did a case on a company that I'm sure you're familiar with, if you asked that question, called PayTM and talked about Vijay Shaker Sharma and his role um, in demonetization or, or demonetization and its effect on the business. So a lot of case content and great students from India. You know, I do think CEOs have to think hard on these political issues. Um, you saw this with Ke uh, Kevin Plank, the CEO of Under Armour. So popular retailer and apparel maker in the United States, he spoke out 
you know, with some praise for President Trump. It wasn't a very overt political statement, given what I could tell, based best what I could tell. But um, one of his main endorsers, Steph Curry, the star for the Golden State Warriors, took exception to that. And because we live in a very polarized time, and because Steph Curry has a lot of power as an endorser, people want Steph Curry on their brand, Kevin Plank had to then sort of, you know, walk back those comments. And that is a really difficult thing when a CEO says something and has to change it. And what's so hard about this is that you might get a lot of positive response on Twitter and a lot of negative response from your employees. You may get positive from your employees and a negative response on Twitter. So for CEOs, part of the toolkit of training a leader of consequence here at Fuqua is thinking about how to balance those different constituencies. I also think if you're doing it for the right reasons, if you believe it, then some of that backlash should be easy to your stomach. Because anytime you're going to speak on an issue, right, you know you're going to get some people who disagree. Um, and if you can do that in a way that you feel at least what I said was true, I think that's probably the best. CEOs need to be careful. Their public relations and communications teams need to be around them. How much they empower them to work with them in terms of how they craft their statements is key. Twitter, I mean, is like a 24-7 microphone that's always on. So CEOs have this great opportunity to speak directly to their consumers and their employees, to Jenny's point, but they also have a risk in terms of what, who they might alienate. I mean, James, you've talked about this a little bit with Disney in your discussion. So James's team did a final project on Disney. What about Disney and the, and the China-Hong Kong protests? I mean, we've talked a little bit about that. Would it make sense for Disney CEO to speak out? How would he, how would he weigh it back and forth? That's one of the things I wanted to ask you during the presentation. So I guess my, I think the CEO is, is in a very difficult place because in my mind, it's tough to separate Disney from American values all the way through World War II, where they made videos for the, the US um, I believe the New York Times even quoted that Disney is the American way salesman or something mm -hmm. along those lines. And it's tough to separate their image that they built up in my mind over the last 70 plus years. Yet at the same time, Disney has a lot of business interest in, in China. They got a $5.5 billion park in, in Shanghai. There's Hong Kong Disneyland, second biggest movie market, maybe first yeah. now. Good point. And they even did this in the past in 97 where they they made a uh, movie that supported Tibet and just their revenue dried up overnight and it took them a long time to get in the good graces. I mean, so in this case, our or my group, we came to the conclusion that not to say a lot mm -hmm. right away, um, kind of wait for an inflection point where you, you have to speak out and at that point, we recommend that they they stay true to their values, but until that point comes, just hope for a safe, speedy recovery yeah. in Hong Kong. And, and honestly, I don't know what else they can really do. And this was in the presentations, it was interesting to watch, and I want to get Jenny's take on this, is like there wasn't a lot of black and white in these presentations that we had in the last day of class. We challenge students, we do this in most classes at the end, to identify their own problem, their own company, political and social issue they're facing, and figure out how to deal with it. And a lot of students were left really thinking about things in this gray area or thinking about strategic inaction, not necessarily speaking out, waiting to see how things developed. And some people responded really well. They said, that was good business. And other people said, but you're abandoning your values. And there was this back and forth, which I think is a really healthy tension. Why? Because if we're not having this conversation in the classroom, how are we going to have it in the boardroom? Um, Jenny, for you, I mean, again, the oil and gas example is an interesting one. A lot of people are calling on CEOs from those industries to do all sorts of things, um, whether it's commitment to renewables or supporting prices on carbon, some things that would be consistent with their business interests, but others that might not. So there's a lot of risk there. I mean, what's your sense of some of the CEOs in those industries and how what they're weighing on that, just given your experience and now moving on to consulting where you might be giving advice to them directly? Yeah. You know? Uh, it's an interesting problem, honestly. And one of the things that I found most interesting is how the people in those industries view it versus how other people That's view it. Yeah. So a lot of times when I talk to my peers at Fuqua, everybody says, oh my gosh, those oil and gas CEOs must feel terrible, right? They, they're all yes. responsible for this. They're spilling oil into the Gulf, et cetera. And I think one of the interesting things is the people in the energy industry feel that they are truly providing a service to yes. everybody. They are putting the lights on over your head. They are enabling Twitter to do yeah. free speech. They are helping society and they view it as a society problem that we as a society need to consume less energy just because they're producing it doesn't mean they're using yes. it. Yes. Uh, so it's an interesting so viewpoint about like who who is actually responsible for this problem. And I think in our class we've talked a lot about stakeholders and the different stakeholders involved in discussions. Yes. And it's interesting to see who it is. So in your example for Disney, like is it Disney who should be suing something? Is it the general society who should be putting pressure on it? Is it legislation? Yes. And that's I think something you've talked about with the Definitely. intersection. Yeah, it's a great point too. I love this idea about 
executives in different industries think about their roles differently. You know, one of the things in the class, and you'll see from you know Jenny and James have different opinions between them, between people in class, is there is no right answer for this stuff. I mean, so you have to develop your own personal framework and how you're gonna think about this. When you're going to business school, you're already a fully formed human being, right? You've gone to undergrad, you've worked. Here, I think the best thing we can do is we'll give you new information, but we can also help you reflect on your own way of thinking. Because like my hope is that when James and Jenny are running companies, they'll be more reflective on what they're doing and why they're doing it, and it'll be consistent with what they actually want to accomplish. That's the point. Not that they'll necessarily support something that I agree with or that anyone else in the class agrees with. And I think that example of the oil and gas CEOs and how they think about it is like really interesting. The thing I think is building empathy and understanding how other people see the issue is key, right? And that's why it's good to have a diversity of thought at Fuqua on these different issues so people can hear different points of view. Because I mean, we talk to this all the time. We're gonna lead in a divided world. You're gonna lead diverse communities. And if you've never heard the other side, whatever it is, you're probably not going to be as very, as effective. So that's that's another way to think about it. And actually, we've got some more questions. Oh, more questions. Rolling We're here. rolling. This, this is, is great. Uh, we have one from Kyle Moma, a oh. MBA alum, actually. Okay. And uh, we were talking about empathy for other people, but he has a question on stock prices, yeah. which may be a little bit <laughs> Kyle, more Kyle, you ruthless capitalist. That's all you want to hear about. <laughs> I, I got it. So Kyle's question is, how can um, how much can we attribute a change in stock price to a political stance other um, or other variables? We've seen how stock prices at Nike, Dick's, et cetera, have responded to CEO activism, but we've also seen how Chick-fil-A has seen wild success despite only just recently bending to public pressure about their donations to anti lb LGBT organizations? Yeah, it's a great question. And this is one where having a background as an economist helps because when you read the articles in the newspaper or in any media source, whenever a company takes a stand, the next day something will happen to the stock price. And people on both sides of the debate, if you agree with what the company said, you want to say, look, their stock price went up. And if you disagree, you want to say, look, their stock price went down. I will tell everyone watching, don't pay attention to any of those articles. Um, if you're going to do an analysis like this, you can't just look at one stock. There's other things happening in the stock market, so the ha things happen to equity prices. At the very least, you need to control for other companies in their sector. If all the companies in that sector went down, it doesn't mean that Target's position on single occupancy bathrooms or allowing people who identify as transgender to choose the bathroom they want cause a stock price decrease or an increase. And so when you look at Nike's response to Colin Kaepernick, you have to look at it over a long term compare it to other companies in their sector, and frankly, control for all the other things that are affecting the markets before you can draw any conclusion. I think the challenge is we all want near-term information to say that was right or that was wrong. The stock market is gonna be really useful for many things, but on a particular statement that a CEO made on a day where 500 other things happened, it's very difficult to tease that out. Over the long term, I'm sure they're tracking those things that they should, but there's probably other metrics. It's the things that Jenny mentioned earlier, employee morale and employee staff survey results, right? Things about same store sales where they can track it over time, things that they can compare to themselves over a long period rather than looking at the stock price, which has a lot of noisy indicators. That would be my view on it. Um, no, no one will stop writing those articles. They're too good for clickbait, but uh, I don't pay attention to them. Right. Yeah. We've got more questions oh, this rolling is, this in. This is great. Popular, right? we, either that or we're provoking people to angrily <laughs> shout at their, their computer and mobile screens. Uh, so we have one from Zachary in New York City, okay. and he's asking, how are you seeing firms create structure to assess activism decision points and creating measurement mechanisms in place to assess impacts, aka customer sentiment, employee sentiment, yeah. uh, sales impacts, et cetera? This is great. I mean, Zach, that's a good question. You should come to Fuqua if you're looking at business <laughs> schools. We'll talk about this all the time. One is, it started off like the Wild West, and we talked about this a lot in class. I would talk to public relations people who'd say, my CEO wakes up on the East Coast, and before we wake up on the West Coast, he or she has already tweeted out stuff that we need to clean up. So think about that world, right, in terms of like your CEO just tweeting whatever he and she wants. It has now evolved that some companies are now taking a more kitchen cabinet role to how they decide things. My view, I haven't talked to all the companies in the space, but talking to a few and also a few CEOs, a few communications people, and also some of the consulting firms that operate in this space, I think a lot of firms are opening up structures where it's almost like they deal with crisis management. So they have a holding statement, something that they use to respond to an issue coming up, like if there's a mass shooting, if there's an issue around immigration or a court decision, and then they go doing the work behind the scenes to figure out what they actually want to say beyond that holding statement. Other CEOs and companies are more entrepreneurial. I mean, this is the challenge. Everybody wants to be first. Everyone wants to be authentic and cutting edge. You have to be willing to, if you're going to do that, to have the trade-off, which is sometimes you're going to put your foot in your mouth. And that's like, I mean, I'd ask James and Jenny in a second how they're going to think about that in their own careers. But I know CEOs, you got to kind of make the decision on that. Do you want to be the person who has to walk things back, or the person who's going to be maybe second, third, or maybe fifth in terms of speaking out? 
a few companies, and particularly in professional services where James and Jenny are gonna work, have set up a system where they'll have, let's say, a, a regular meeting, a monthly meeting with the leadership team to say, here's the things that are coming up. You know, for example, on the political scene, we know we're gonna have a big free trade agreement that's being debated today and maybe passed, right? We have an election coming up in 2020. We have an election in another country. We have things going on in China. What's gonna be our position as a large consulting firm when people ask us? And I think that kind of proactive approach is what you're starting to, to, to uh, see. Metrics, they're measuring media uh, mentions, they're measuring employee and staff responses and intranet kind of discussions about these kind of things, and also other social media metrics around brand is the things that they're seeing there. Mostly correlations, um, hard to you know develop a statement and I'd love to see what it causes, but I think that's what I'm seeing. Thinking about this though for you two, I mean, what kind of leader do you think you want to be? The one who is maybe not necessarily jumping in on any issue, and we can think about political, social, or otherwise, or the person who might come in a little later to the game, but with a kind of more sort of reasoned view. I mean, and taking into account there's some trade-offs if you're gonna do that, because you're not gonna be first. How are you two thinking about that, James first and Jenny? Um, I'd say really thinking about it now, I wanna be pretty clear on my position mm -hmm. on, on the issues. And I think if ever in a CEO position, the company values that as a CEO you're gonna help create and enforce, I think that's very important because you're never gonna know what issue is gonna pop up. Like they come out of nowhere. And and so just understanding where you are on the big issues I think is important. Personally, I wouldn't wanna wait in on everything, but for the big issues, just staying true to myself and being able to put uh, my money where my mouth is in the sense that eventually you're gonna have to take a stand that's gonna cost you something. And to me, that's the only stand that's really yes. a stand. And so just knowing your values ahead of time, I think is very important. That's actually, that's a great answer to Zach's question too, which is the, the quickest way to respond is to have a, a discussion way before about what your corporate values are. If you do, and I know that Mark Benioff at Salesforce and others are thinking like that, which is we know what our values are, we can respond more quickly. Jenny, how about you? I mean, in social media world, right? If you don't respond, I mean, in the next minute, you're sort of slow. James is saying it's important to speak on these issues and he wants on the big things know where he is. How, how would you approach it if you were a leader in these cases? You know what, if I was actually a CEO, I hate to say it, but I think I would take a really risk averse stance. Mm -hmm. This is not for me. Like I know that if someone put a microphone in my face right away, I would say something stupid. <laughs> and so I don't wanna do that. And especially not when it's not just my personal opinions, sure. but it actually represents the company. So for me, actually, I think if someone interviewed me right outside a decision yeah. about something, I would have have to utter the horrible no comment statement yes. and think about it a little bit before I wanted to regroup with my company and issue a statement because I wouldn't want to put my foot in my mouth despite what my values may be. See, two, two different opinions, but really good ones and both represented in class. We, we do a class where we talk a lot about the media and we won't talk too much more about that because it's a fun class um, and a lot of surprises. But <laughs> in that class, we talk a lot about when it's right to say no comment, when it's not, and students have a healthy debate about it. And I think you can have different leadership styles too. It's not clear to me, and I don't think to anyone watching that, there's just one way to be an effective leader, an effective CEO. We all read these books, we look at famous people we admire, but there seems to be different models. And so I think Jenny and James have articulated two different ones when it comes to responding to controversies. Yeah. How are we doing? Do we have more people? We actually learning? have one last question oh, coming fantastic. in. I think we might get cut off here. Oh, wow, okay. Yes, yes. it's gone by so fast, so it's good. <laughs> uh, we have one from Robert in Monterey, California. Uh -huh. And he asked, where do you think sensitivity levels with corporations will trend on social issues going forward? It feels like now we're in a heightened level good or bad, for example, the Peloton bike commercial. Yeah, that's a good point. We're all, we all know that. Yeah, so Robert, thank you for that question. Um, and I think, when I think about that, and he, the Peloton one is, I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. We talked about the Gillette ad and a lot of other ads in class that have been sort of either intentionally or unintentionally about social and political issues. We talked in class the first day about how politically polarized we are. And that's something you're seeing in the United States and in many other countries, though not all. And that political polarization to the extent it's making us into different tribes with, with, with heightened sensitivities to what the other tribe is saying or doing. And when brand identity gets tied up in there, that's what I think is happening. And that's what I think is part of the reason you're seeing so much. So as long as we have a lot of political polarization, and as long as a lot of brands are trying to sell us more than a cup of coffee, more than a car, but an identity, a way of being, I think you're gonna to continue to see this kind of sensitivity towards brand stands and emphasis on it. Um, I don't know how it will look uh, 10 years from now or five years from now. You could argue that you know, what changes in Washington, D.C. might 
might change this, but I actually think this predates President Trump and many of the things that people often attribute to it. I was studying this since 2015. So my sense is we're gonna keep seeing it for the near future as long as we're politically polarized. But it isn't the type of thing that we can predict with a lot of certainty. So uh, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes over the next couple of months. So as we, as we think about wrapping up here, um, I want to also remind people to follow Fuqua on LinkedIn. Um, what's really cool about the Fuqua School of Business is we're trying to do new things. This class is an example of one of the new things we're doing. Um, we've never done a class like this at Fuqua, so Jenny and James got to see an experiment uh, as it was coming off the ground, which is exciting and also scary sometimes. Also, like we're trying to do new things with social media, so LinkedIn Live is a great example of that. I think this is the first time we've ever done it at Fuqua, and uh, the audience, you can tell me in the comments whether you, we should keep doing it. But I want to thank Jenny and James for, for doing a great job and joining me today, and also everyone at the Fuqua School of Business who made it possible. Uh, if you want to hear more about CEO activism, have more questions, send us some more stuff, leave it in the comments. But for now, we're signing off from the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. Thank you.